substance abuse problem. This says lots of things to me. And I think it is fundamentally, ultimately, an issue of national security of the United States of America. I speak this evening in the spirit of what Mahatma Gandhi said more than a half century ago, quote, my life is my message. And each of us has a life story to tell. Mine includes this. I grew up on a farm in the snow belt of upstate New York. One of nine children. What I know about hard work is because of that. What I know about values begins with my own parents. And ultimately the farm didn't make it. And hence as a teenager I moved with my family to what was a still segregated state. A time when water commons were still labeled white and colored. A time when black people and white people could not be legally married. A time when the sheriff of my county, Manatee County on the west coast of Florida, could get away, could get away with winging a Ku Klux Klan motorcade through the streets of Black East Bradenton. A time that while I attended an all-white school, the black kids were bussed across the river to another school. But what stayed with me then and now is what my parents taught me. To respect everyone, to treat everyone with respect and dignity and fairness, and there would be no exceptions. You can tell by the intelligence in my eyes that I went to the University of Florida. <laughs> I went to the University of Florida at a time when in its undergraduate division, there were only white kids there. The first African-American undergraduates came to the campus while I was there. Times, I promise you, were hateful, tense, ugly. The campus was absolutely and completely divided. And the parents that I had and the values they gave me left me on the right side of that issue and justice. My definition of pluralism embraces people of all colors, of all heritages and cultures, all ages, men and women, able-bodied and not, people of different sexual orientation. My definition is room for everyone, people with families and people without families, people who pray and people who do not, people with children in schools and those who do not have children in schools. People who fight for the environment and people who fight for the very essentials of life. People who handle hammers and people who drive trucks and people who prepare food and people with power and people without power. People with means and people without means. Everyone. I read a lot of history. And I don't think I'm naive. I was a paid skeptic for 35 years, but I feel blessed not to be a cynic. Blessed not to be a cynic. Ours, if we tell the truth, is a nation where discrimination is far from infrequent, where many people do not have an opportunity for their fair share of reward and responsibility. Each of us, I would argue, is to a greater or lesser extent a prisoner of our own biases. You and me. Most often the faith or color or gender or nationality we know most about is our own. We build our biases what we have, based on what we have seen, what we have experienced, what we have been told, what we have read or learned. But if we're honest with one another, too often, though, we have not learned enough to accumulate the wisdom to challenge our own prejudices. So good people struggle all their lives with the human tendency to feel most comfortable with people just like ourselves. I told you I read a lot of history and I understand, I think, fully that progress is simply not possible 
without struggle. And in that struggle, mustering the inner wisdom and the strength to confront oneself, the deepest possible learning comes to pass. If you read history, you know that progress has never been achieved by goodwill alone. Indeed, progress requires conflict, requires conflict. People pushing and shoving and insisting that what is right and fair be done. If you look at the history of this country, that is how suffrage was achieved and Social Security and Medicare and health care reform. It's how we have made progress in civil rights and in women's rights. All were matters of basic equity. All were fought and frequently bitterly so. A few months back, I was in Orlando and spent some time with a woman named Patricia Schroeder. How many people remember that name? I had at least three here. Five, six, seven. Okay, good. Anyone from the Herald remember Patricia? <laughs> I feel okay, and four more from the arrow. <laughs> that shooter is a Colorado, now lives in Florida. She spent 24 years in Congress and was a serious candidate for President of the United States in the 80s. And in my conversation with her, I talked about background and education. And she went to Harvard Law School. And in her class were 500 people. And she was there with 14 other women. If my math is correct and it was not my strong subject, that's 3%. So if you go check with Harvard Law School today and find out the most recent graduating class, 47% of Harvard Law School students are women. And similar percentages or greater can be found at law schools all across America, including the University of Miami and FIU and St. Thomas and the University of Florida. And could there be anyone in this room who thinks this was achieved by goodwill? It wasn't. Is there anyone in this room who thinks this was achieved because most people simply awaken at a moment and thought, oh, we need to be more fair. We need to make sure women have equal opportunity. Of course not. So none of us should be permitted to forget the lessons of history and humanity. I am not a revolutionary. I'm not a radical. I am fully willing to compromise and work within the system. But to be straightforward, it is neither a radical nor a revolutionary thought that people ought to be treated fairly. Indeed, it is supposed to be the very definition of what our country, our country, is supposed to be all about. You and I could not possibly fulfill the potential destiny of the United States of America, or what it really means to be American, if we are not embracing everyone, if we are not insisting on a fair opportunity for all. Should we achieve that? Should all of us and many more do that? We would build a stronger, better educated, safer, more prosperous, more contributing community for everyone. And that finally is what our country and our real community is all about. So I say thank you. May God and Allah bless us all.